Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Coffee Chat with Matt. We're here at Wasco Nursery, and we have a beautiful weekend uh, ahead of us here. The sun is shining, and uh, there's a nice cool breeze right now. It's supposed to get a little warmer today, but uh, we finally got a little rain. Uh, we'd certainly love quite a bit more rain, um, but we're, uh, we're thankful for what we got. Uh, here on uh, Thursday, I guess Thursday into I guess really yesterday morning really, we got a little over a quarter inch, almost uh, three tenths of an inch here at, uh, at the garden center. Uh, just a little east of us in town, I think it was closer to between a third and a half inch and there were some other uh, areas in the Chicago land uh, region that got closer to uh, one inch. So that's great, we would still love to see quite a bit more, but uh, again, thankful for what we have. So. Um, today's topic is uh, on pollinators. Um, that isn't uh, by chance. This is the start of National Pollinator Week. Um, we've got a lot to talk about there, so that's going to be fun. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to uh, just remind everybody about our Father's Day uh, Food Truck Festival, which is tomorrow here at the Garden Center. It's going to be on our West Lawn area. So. If you're unfamiliar with our property, the, we have an east parking lot and a west parking lot. And west of the west parking lot, we have a large lawn area. So we're gonna have some food trucks set up out there. We've got picnic tables, we've got some canopies. We're gonna have some uh, patio tables and chairs set up. And we've got some great vendors coming. Uh, Jindo's Hot Sauce, Burger Buzz, uh, Fire and Smoke, uh, Pierogi Joe. Um, so it's gonna be a really fun time. Um, take the guesswork out of cooking for dad. Just come on by. It's from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Sunday, which is tomorrow, June 20th. So we'd love to see you there for that. Okay, so pollinator week. Um, some of you are probably uh, unfamiliar with it. Why is there even a pollinator week? That type of thing. Why do we need to talk about it? Why should we be talking about it? And the fact of the matter is that um, generally speaking, or on average, one out of every three bites of food you take is the direct result of a pollinator doing its job. So that's pretty huge. Up to 85% of our food crops require a pollinator to do their job in order for that crop um, to, you know, to develop. So this is everything from alfalfa, which then the cows eat. So we don't have milk and we don't have beef if we don't have alfalfa. Uh, almost all of your fruit that you're eating, uh, maybe for breakfast even this morning, you know, maybe you have a banana, maybe you have a bowl of uh, blackberries or raspberries or something like that. All of that is the direct result of a pollinator doing its job. So it's really important that we talk about it because as uh, the United States in particular, but in the world in general, as uh, more development happens, as um, you know, natural habitats are lost, we need to try to recreate some of that. Um, you can't recreate all of it, but some of that even right in our home landscape. So uh, we've got some great plants that we're gonna talk about that will help you bring pollinating species into your yard, um, which is A, fun to watch. You know, we're talking beautiful butterflies, gorgeous moths, hummingbirds, things like that. Um, as well as the honeybees and bumblebees and a whole bunch of other things. So when we talk about pollinators, it's not just bees. It is all of those other species. So bats, which uh, we do have around here, but they don't really pollinate around here. But bats uh, do pollinate a lot of our fruit. So things like uh, avocados and bananas and guava and mango, all of those kind of things are pollinated by bats, uh, as well as uh, some other uh, insects. Um, so bats are a pollinator, uh, hummingbirds, there are quite a few uh, beetle species that are pollinators. Uh, some plants like the uh, pawpaw trees that I have at home, so pawpaw forms a really interesting um, fruit about this long. It's green and the inside is yellow and it tastes like banana custard. Um, it's a native plant species in Illinois, but the pawpaw is pollinated by a fly. The flowers are very small. They come out in the um, mid springtime and they smell like rotting flesh. And you're like, well, that's kind of gross. It's at the back of my yard, so I don't ever smell it. But a lot of plants uh, mimic the smell of rotting flesh to attract flies. Um, so they'll, they'll attract flies to them and the flies do the pollinating job. Some things are going to be more sweet and those are going to attract things like the honeybees, bumble, the Eastern bumblebee, 
uh, and hummingbirds. And then of course we have our uh, butterfly group and our moth group. So all of those combine to be the category that we call pollinators. Um, and that's what we're talking about today. So uh, how can we bring them to our yard and then how can we just help them out so that you, you know, if we've got a, a, maybe a, a nature preserve or something over here and another one over here, how can we connect that? So part of it is, is if, you know, if each of us does our job and we bring pollinating uh, plant, you know, plants that pollinators are going to love into our landscape, now we're creating corridors, uh, corridors for getting from uh, this forest preserve over here in DuPage County to this forest preserve over here in Kane County or this prairie on the north side of Kane County and this prairie on the south side of Kane County, that type of thing. So that's sort of the goal there, um, as well as just providing uh, habitat for these, uh, for these pollinating species. So um, first of all, if you are trying to uh, attract pollinating species to your landscape, um, you want to think about three basic things. And it's the same thing that all of us, doesn't matter what kind of, uh, of animal you are, you need food, you need shelter, and you need water. Those are the three basic elements for life. Uh, and we need to provide each of those to get pollinating species into our yard. So in terms of water, obviously water is scarce this year. So there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, you can just put out a bowl of water. I mean, just something as simple as that, putting a small bowl of water out somewhere in the landscape, uh, you know, a shallow bowl. Don't leave it out there um, at, to get, you know, algae and nasty and gross. You know, they want clean water, of course, just like we do, we want clean water. So change it out. Just something as simple as that is a great way to do it. You could put in a water feature. We have all sorts of little uh, recirculating water features. So they don't require plumbing. They're very uh, energy efficient and water efficient because they're recirculating the same water. So at home in the front of my house, I have a handful of uh, basalt, which is a type of stone. I've got a few basalt columns. They were cored out, just drilled out through the center. They sit on a basin. There's a pump down inside the basin and it just recirculates the same water. So I have this beautiful uh, water feature. The water bubbles up out of the top. It's nice and clean. It goes down through a little bed of gravel before it gets back to the filter. And that bed of gravel sort of, or uh, before it gets to the pump, and so that bed of gravel acts like a natural filter, cleaning out the uh, water of debris and things like that. So the birds love it, the dragonflies love it, uh, the wasps are over there drinking out of it. So I see all sorts of species, uh, even the squirrels will go over there and drink out of it. So provide clean water, that's number one. Provide shelter. So when we think about shelter, it can be, it can be all sorts of things. So if we're talking about the pollinating species, you know, the the hummingbirds and other uh, uh, birds, bats, things like that, uh, providing habitat such as uh, trees for them to nest in or roost in, depending upon what they are, that's gonna be helpful. So you could put up a bat house, you can put up bird houses, you can uh, plant uh, specifically densely branched trees like hawthorn, uh, spruce trees, uh, arborvita, things like that, that that the birds can nest in. Those would be uh, one example of providing good habitat. Uh, habitat for some other wildlife might mean a pile of branches in the backyard for something like a fox to get underneath. But in terms of this talk, we're talking about pollinating species. So uh, providing cover for the, for the uh, birds and moths and things like that is great. Um, now, if we're talking about things like moths and butterflies, uh, their shelter is uh, on a smaller plant because they're going to uh, uh, lay eggs on a plant. They're going to form a chrysalis on a plant. So in that you may have to have a specific species like when we start thinking about monarchs which we'll talk about uh, you're going to need some of the uh, milkweed species in order for them to have uh, their shelter basically um, so we've got water we've got shelter and then of course we all need to eat the pollinators need to eat and that's the purpose of today's talk is to talk about species that you can plant in your yard to uh, benefit and or attract pollinating species so um, I have probably way more plants than uh, <laughs> than we can talk about today. I felt a little bit like I was at the buffet and my, you know, my appetite was this big, but I could only eat so much. Uh, but I have a lot of species here to talk about. We'll see how many we can get through. Uh, I'll probably go fairly fast through them because I do have a lot of them to cover. Um, today, I'm only going to talk about uh, herbaceous perennials. So uh, these are plants that come up in the springtime 
They're going to flower throughout, whether depending upon the species in the spring, in the summer, or in the late summer. Uh, they will flower and then they will die to the ground, but come back next year. So those are herbaceous perennials. There are also a lot of uh, uh, shrubs that we can be planting to attract pollinators to our yard. We're actually gonna talk about those next week. So today is just the herbaceous perennials. Um, I don't uh, have any uh, order necessarily to, uh, to the plants that I'll talk about. However, if you aren't already a member of our VIG club, which stands for Very Important Gardener, um, it's not really much of a club so much as it is a, uh, um, an e-newsletter that we send out via email. We don't sell it, uh, your email address to anybody else. Uh, we don't send out emails uh, you know, three, five times a week like some uh, big national brands and things like that. So you're gonna get an email from us periodically if you sign up for that VIG newsletter uh, on our website, wascoenursery.com. We'll actually give you a $5 off coupon for your next purchase. Um, but uh, we will this week be sending out um, an email and it's going to be in reference to pollinators and it's going to have a, a breakdown based on the time of year. So if you're looking for pollinating species for earlier in the season, uh, that'll, that'll be broken down late, uh, late spring, early summer, midsummer, late summer, early fall, that type of thing. So it's gonna be broken down in that way. So you'll have a nice little list there that you can get. So uh, you could sign up for that at our website. We also um, have a, uh, some handouts here. This is just a, um, a handout called Recommended Natives for the Garden and Landscape. It was put together by our friends over at Natural Garden Natives, which is one of our uh, favorite plant suppliers of native plant material. They're local ecotypes, so all of this is seed grown, seed collected within like a 250 mile radius of our area, so it's great. Um, they grow wonderful plants and uh, we're happy to have them here. But this is a wonderful brochure on recommended native plant material that is, we'll just call it a little more well-behaved because some plant material in the, in the prairies and, and in the wild areas really can go rogue, it can reseed itself a lot. Um, so these are some of the more uh, landscape friendly plants that you can use. Um, there will be some little asterisk, asterisks by some of the plants and you'll notice that some of them will say will spread by seed or rhizomes but is not overly aggressive will reseed and or spread more aggressively, but if you cut back the seeds before they mature on the plant, uh, the, those seeds won't be dispersed. And then some other ones are just spring ephemerals, which means that they come up in the spring, they're there for a very short period of time, and then they go away or go dormant uh, for the summer months. So those are kind of denoted on there. So it's a really good resource. You can come in here and we'll hand those out to you. We also will be posting um, a few resources uh, from, uh, pollinator.org and from Natural Garden, Resor uh, Natural Garden Natives. So those resources will be posted uh, in that email that we send out. We'll also try to get those posted on uh, Facebook here. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar with pollinator.org, it's a great website. Uh, you could go on there, you can type in your zip code. It'll tell you, you know, um, a little bit more about what your area or our area used to look like. Uh, before settlement, plants that should be here, plants that you can be using in your landscape, that type of thing. So um, it's really neat. There's also a lot of other great resources on there, especially if you have a little larger property. So, all right, let's talk about plants. We'll just talk about the ones that are up here in front of us now, and then we'll change these out. This is uh, a salvia right here, um, salvia nemrosa. Uh, this one is called Marcus. It's a short salvia. We have probably 20 different flavors of salvia back there. This one happens to be very short, which I like. Um, so some salvia tend to look like a cat sat on them. This one does not. Uh, this one blooms and stays nice and tight and sturdy. Uh, as soon as they're done blooming, I take the entire plant, I grab it like this, and I just cut off all of those uh, dried flowers, and then it'll throw out a second set of blooms, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. So these will pretty much bloom all season long. This has been blooming, uh, this particular plant right here for sure has been blooming since uh, early May and is still blooming beautifully. So that's Marcus salvia, gets about maybe eight inches tall, full sun. We'll be talking quite a bit about some uh, native plant material. Like I mentioned, Natural Garden Natives is our uh, native plant supplier. So these are grown right here in St. Charles, uh, just right down the street from us is their uh, native plant production facility, so uh, we're very fortunate to have them right here in our backyard. Um, 
This particular plant is one of my absolute favorites. I have a ton of this at home. This is called common spiderwort, or you'll also see it listed as Ohio spiderwort. Um, this plant is really neat. Each of these flowers lasts exactly one day, uh, and they're only open during the day. So at night, they're gone, they're closed, there's nothing there, and then the next day, you're going to get more flowers. Beautiful uh, purple, tri sort of triangular shaped or square shaped flowers, really neat. Um, little yellow centers. Uh, the, the bees absolutely love these. They're always on them, the honeybees, as well as the eastern bumblebee. I see those on these a lot at home. If you're looking for hummingbirds in your yard, um, I would uh, for sure recommend this plant right here. This, this one is called, uh, this is a cardinal flower called black truffle, but you can use any of the cardinal flowers if you're trying to attract hummingbird species uh, to your yard. We only basically have the one ruby-throated hummingbird around here. If you go west of the Mississippi, or, or I think maybe even uh, a little further than that, you'll find uh, they have about 30 different species of hummingbirds out there. We only have basically the one um, here, ruby-throated, but uh, they're beautiful and they're fun to, to watch. So cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis is its name. There's, uh, we sell the regular, what we call straight species, which is just the native plant here. We also sell black truffle and Monet Moment and a whole bunch of other uh, kind of unique varieties. Black truffle has this beautiful burgundy foliage. It still has the traditional bright red flower of the cardinal flower, which the hummingbirds love. It develops a flower stalk up the center with a long tubular red flower, which the hummingbirds love. Um, all of the Lobelia, specifically Lobelia cardinalis, loves a little more moist location. It can tolerate uh, wet soils to average. It is not going to love a super hot, dry, gravelly, you know, sandy kind of soil. It's not going to love that at all. Um, there's also a blue version of Lobelia, which is called Great Blue Lobelia, uh, which is native here, which actually likes it more on the average to dry or you know moist to average maybe a little more uh, uh, a little more dry tolerant than the uh, cardinal flower so that's that one I'm actually watching a uh, a ruby throated hummingbird pollinating our uh, Monarda over on the table right now which is kind of fun um, we'll talk about Monarda here in a little bit uh, this is Nepeta or cat mint. Um, this is not a native plant, but is an uh, absolute favorite of pollinators. Um, this particular one is from Proven Winners. It's a little, uh, a little more compact, a little more refined cat mint or nepeta. Uh, this is called cat's pajamas. We have uh, several different varieties, more than several, um, of cat mint. Some bloom a little earlier, some bloom a little later. But uh, the honeybees and the bumblebees absolutely love these. Um, some of you might be thinking, why would I want to attract bees to uh, my landscape? And I always like to remind everybody that uh, specifically honeybees and bumblebees have a job to do. They are pollinating species. They are uh, collecting uh, pollen to take back to their hive. They obviously, in the case of honeybees, will create honey, but they have a job to do. They are not aggressive insects at all. Um, I actually happen to be allergic to bees. Some of you may have heard me mention that before. I uh, consistently will be around plant material, as you can guess. There are bees all over it. I am not worried about those. I don't like the yellow jackets when they start coming around um, because they are aggressive. But, but the honeybees and bumblebees are not going to bother you if you don't bother them. So, you know, a lot of times we'll even have bumblebees uh, or honeybees on these plants and we'll be carrying them around and they'll visit it as we're walking, that type of thing. So really isn't an issue there. I suppose I could probably grab a couple of the other. This is um, this is a milkweed right here called butterfly weed. Uh, one of my absolute favorites. So you can see those brilliant orange colored flowers. Uh, the monarchs absolutely love this, as do most of the other butterflies in our area. So butterfly weed will get about 20, 28 inches tall. It likes a drier soil. Um, so a well-drained soil is great, average soil is great. If you have a real heavy clay uh, and it doesn't drain very well, you may uh, develop some root rot on the plant. So when I have people lose the plant over the winter, it generally has to do with root rot. Um, I generally plant these, water them very, very sparingly. 
and then let it go. And uh, they are, they're actually, once they get themselves established, are very fast growing. Uh, they bloom for a long time and they have these brilliant orange flowers. This is both a food source for the adult monarch, so the, the butterfly itself will land on here and feed on the, uh, on the pollen and nectar. Uh, and then the, they, will, they can lay eggs and the eggs can hatch and the caterpillar, the larva of the butterfly, can feed on the foliage. So interestingly enough, the adult can feed, the adult monarch can feed on all sorts of species. So it could visit um, uh, uh, a monarda, it can visit um, a butterfly plant, like a um, butterfly bush, it can visit all sorts of other things. But the larva can only survive on the Asclepius family, which is the, uh, which is the milkweed family. Uh, it cannot lay eggs and survive on any other plant species in the world. So Asclepius is very, very critical to the success of the monarch population. So butterfly weed, common milkweed, swamp milkweed, all of those. I'll show you a few of the others real quick if I can find them on my cart. found a couple of the others I'm not uh, so this is a swamp milkweed or rose milkweed right here so swamp milkweed as the name suggests can tolerate a more moist or wet location unlike the uh, common milkweed which I don't have a sample of right here but we do have in stock I think I have one on my cart somewhere um, common milkweed likes it very dry world milkweed which is this one right here which has this really cool ferny textured foliage that likes it on the dry side, uh, and then the butterfly weed likes it on the dry side. The swamp milkweed likes it a little more on the moist uh, side. So this is swamp milkweed. It gets quite tall. It can get upwards of three, maybe even four feet tall. Develops this really pretty pink flower on the top. Um, favorite of, uh, of the butterflies, so that's a really good one. Uh, world milkweed is much shorter, and it has a white flower. Um, and it has this really ferny texture. These uh, particular ones here in the small black pots, these we actually grow ourselves. We love, we love the Asclepius, we love to provide uh, plants for, uh, for monarchs, so we go out of our way to try to grow as much of this as we can. So these are all grown from seed here at Wasco. Uh, world milkweed, swamp milkweed, we also have common milkweed and butterfly weed, and we do have them in a variety of different sizes. So. If you're looking for small and inexpensive things that you can plant a lot of, we've got these. If you just want to make a statement and plant some gallon pots, you can do something like that. This is probably one of my uh, favorite perennials here for the home landscape. This is an allium or what's called a summer blooming onion. This particular one is uh, called Millennium, but we have a bunch of different varieties. They are very, very similar. They all have these purple kind of golf ball sized flowers. Millennium tends to be a little darker purple than some of the others. Some of them are a little uh, more bluey or whitish purple. Uh, they all bloom very heavily starting right about now. They're just getting ready to bloom. In fact, this flower isn't even fully open, but there's lots of buds on here. They have this really nice dark green foliage, uh, sort of grass-like in texture, has a little curve to it, forms a nice mound. Uh, rabbits and deer don't like them, which is great, uh, but the um, butterflies and the bees absolutely love these, uh, and they will bloom for quite a while. Um, this is Millennium. We have Peekaboo and Summer Beauty and Serendipity, which has kind of a bluish colored foliage. Uh, Medusa, which has a really cool twisty stem to it. So all of them are great. They're all very easy to grow. Most of them are quite short, so they're a great foreground or border plant, uh, and they like full sun. This particular uh, plant here uh, is an Anis hyssop or uh, Agastache. Called uh, this one is called Little Adder, which is a shorter one. We also have Blue Fortune and some others. Uh, Anise hyssop is kind of cool. If you break the leaf and smell it, it smells like black licorice, which is kind of cool. Another one that the rabbits and deer tend not to bother at all. Um, 
great for hummingbirds or yeah hummingbirds butterflies moths all of that uh, they really like these again this one's a little shorter probably 18 to 24 inches tall uh, Blue Fortune and some of those are going to be more in the three, three and a half, even four foot range. And then we have a native one here, the native Anis hyssop, uh, which is kind of a purple colored flower. Um, and that will get upwards of like eight feet tall. So it's, it's actually really tall. Um, so those are, those are cool plants. This is a uh, Liatris or shooting star. This particular one is called Cobalt. Um, cobalt is a, uh, a selection um, that is a little shorter than the native species here. So uh, Liatris spicata, the shooting star, can the native one, which we have on the, uh, in the, on the table over there, will get around four feet tall. This particular one will be more in the 24 to 30 inch range or so, maybe a touch taller. Beautiful flowers, uh, bright purple, just getting ready to bloom. And then now these are going to bloom for uh, probably another eight weeks or so. So really interesting purple fuzzy flowers. The butterflies absolutely love them. Uh, has really cool foliage. So that's cobalt. I brought three cone flowers over. Many of you are probably familiar with cone flower or echinacea. Um, we have literally dozens of different varieties. They are all just coming into bloom right now. And uh, there are so many unique varieties of echinacea. Some of them are um, really unique, like this one right here, which is called raspberry truffle. So you have these nice pink uh, petals with this very fuzzy center area. So most cone flower that you're familiar with probably have that little sort of uh, spiky center there where the seeds will develop. But raspberry truffle has this big fuzzy center making it a really uh, unique flower. It's a heavy blooming variety. Like I said, it's just starting to bloom. So you've got all of these uh, unopened flowers there. Raspberry truffle will get 24 to 36 inches tall. Um, that's a really nice one. We have white ones, yellow ones, all sorts of different ones. All of them are um, visited by the butterflies. Um, another uh, reason that I like to plant echinacea is for the finches. They love to eat the seed heads on these when they're all done blooming. So the butterflies will be all over them at this time of year or coming up here. And then uh, once the flowers are done, the butterflies go, and then the finches will come and start eating all the seeds off of there, which is great. Um, this one is, uh, this is called a pale purple coneflower. This is the uh, Illinois native coneflower. Um, it has a much more slender leaf than, uh, than the straight purple coneflower. It has a very tall, slender flower stalk. It is not in full bloom yet, this particular one is, but in the prairie and in my home landscape, it's in full bloom right now and it has these really pretty uh, petals that almost hang straight down. Uh, so that's pale purple coneflower. It gets quite tall, uh, maybe 36 inches high or so. Very easy to grow, Perversa dry soil, is exceptionally drought tolerant once established. The root system on this will go down several feet, which makes it a very, very drought tolerant plant. Most of our Illinois natives tend to be very drought tolerant. So if you're looking for things that can survive the heat and drought, things like that, look at our natural garden native selection because those are great. Um, I didn't want to mention all of the coneflowers because you could literally spend an entire hour just talking about the different species and different cultivars of them. But this one I think is worth noting. This is called Pixie Meadow Bright. This is actually um, a hybrid introduction that came from the Chicago Botanic Garden. Um, I have this one in my front landscape, the west side of the house. Uh, this is a real winner. It's a little shorter in stature than some of the other uh, coneflowers. It's a, about 24 inches tall. It blooms heavier than any of the other coneflowers that I've ever seen. And it comes back very reliably. Um, really, really a nice plant. Very bushy, very heavy flowering. The finches love the seed. The butterflies are all over the flowers. So that's called Pixie Meadow Bright. It's actually a cross between our native a uh, coneflower and a coneflower that's native to like the Tennessee uh, area. 
uh, Tennessee and Kentucky. So they hybridized it or crossed those two. Really a nice one. So that's Pixie Meadow Bright. All right, I've got uh, here I brought over just two of the Monarda that we have. Um, I think I have a native one uh, or a couple of native ones as well. Let me grab those. So uh, Monarda is a pretty diverse group of plants. We have a bunch of different varieties that we sell um, just for uh, that are, are very, very ornamental. Um, they're cultivars or hybrid crosses, things like that. So. This one here comes from Proven Winners. It's part of a series called the Pardon My series. This one is called Pardon My Cerise. Um, it's a very short statured uh, Monarda or bee balm. This one will only get around 10 inches, excuse me, about 10 inches tall. This, these are absolute hummingbird magnets. If your only goal is to bring hummingbirds into your yard, plant some Monarda or bee balm. These are absolutely uh, hummingbird magnets. So Pardon My Cerise. This one I really like. This is kind of a, uh, basically, this is a native selection. So it's a native plant. It wasn't hybridized with anything. It was just selected for its heavy flowering, uh, fuller, a uh, fuller plant. So it's something that uh, basically someone said, hey, this is, this is gonna be a little better in the home landscape than some of the straight native varieties, but it was a selection. It means someone found a seed grown plant that they noticed this is a little different than all of the other native seed grown plants in the in the prairie this one tends to be a little more compact it tends to flower a little heavier things like that so um, for you native purists out there this is i would say is still a completely native plant in fact it's part of our american beauty's native plant program um, but it is a selection so someone just noticed something unique about it and they, they started growing it um, so each one of these if you get one of these each pink lace is identical because they are um, grown from a division so everyone is the same versus something that is grown from seed where you can have some genetic variation in it like these two plants which are also uh, members of the Monarda family so this is our native what we would call wild bergamot which uh, has a kind of a lavender purple colored flower these all of these Monarda have a very minty fragrance to them um, the uh, the Indians here in Illinois um, used to uh, make a tea out of the leaves. Um, they they um, actually have a, a really unique minty taste to them. Um, so they are edible. And this one will have kind of a lavender colored flower. I brought this one specifically because it actually has some brown spots on the foliage a little bit. And um, it has just a little bit of what we would call powdery mildew, which is a little bit of a uh, kind of a white powdery substance on the leaf. And I brought that for a specific reason. You know, a lot of our native plants, but even our non-native plants, plants get issues just like humans. You know, we all have something wrong with us somewhere along the lines. And so do plants. They're not, they're not perfect. They're not going to be perfect, um, but that's okay. There's nothing wrong with this plant. Um, in fact, in the pot like this, I actually would, uh, would just cut it back and let it reflush a little bit. And that's probably what we'll do with some of these. Uh, in this case, this is a, probably a result of us doing a little more watering on this plant than the plant would like. But even in the landscape, you know, now that we're starting to get into these hot, dry months and water might be uh, less available or, or available inconsistently, you're going to see things like that where you're going to get some browning on the edges or a couple of stems that are going to wilt off, things like that. It's not to say that every plant um, or that, you know, that you might not to need to treat it or it might be something that can be corrected. Um, but, uh, you know, plants in the wild, outside, you're going to have some issues. Um, it's just a matter of expecting it and dealing with it um, and not trying to solve every problem. You know, like this is, this is uh, Monarda punctata or what's called horse mint. It's another native Monarda here. Beautiful white flowers, still has the fragrance. The flowers are really unique. They kind of have like a whitish, pinkish color to them. They're different than the other uh, Monardas, uh, almost like a it's not, but it almost looks like a cross between a coneflower and a monarda or a, or a bee balm rather. Um, so really unique, but these would, all of these are gonna do great in the, in the landscape at home. Um, monarda likes it on the average side to dry, um, so they're not super water loving. Um, they are surprisingly shade tolerant, so they would prefer full sun, but are surprisingly shade tolerant. So um, I, at home, I've got some where, uh, some trees have kind of 
hung over and, and shaded the bed, and the Monarda has kind of made it, uh, worked its way in there. It still blooms very well in part to mostly shade or a lot of filtered uh, shade, and it blooms very well in the full sun in my yard. So I have a ton of it at home. Um, it does range a little bit. It'll grow underground via rhizomes. Um, it's easy to dig up and give to a friend or move to a different part of the yard if it gets out of hand. Um, but uh, I don't care if my whole yard gets covered in that, so it's beautiful. All right, moving right along here. I didn't bring uh, too many plants since we were just talking about shade. I didn't bring too many plants for the shade, but here's a couple. Um, this is an astilbe or what's called a false spirea. I prefer the term uh, astilbe because there's many other plants that also have the name, common name of false spirea. Um, but this one is called vision. Um, astilbe is not very drought tolerant. Um, it likes consistent moisture. And uh, so a lot of people have tried to still be and failed because the ground is too dry where they planted in the dry shade. Uh, Vision a still be is a much more robust a still be. It can tolerate a drier soil. The flowers are absolutely gorgeous. Um, I love this big fuzzy flower. It is very vibrant. There are many other colors available. Even in the Vision series, there's a Vision in red, Vision in white. So if you're looking for a different color other than this sort of pinky uh, purple color, uh, you can get that and still have the nice robust plant. Um, if you do have a more consistent moisture in the ground, you can choose any of the astilbe. Uh, but both butterflies and moths absolutely love astilbe. Um, one of them that I see on uh, astilbe on a regular basis is, is a uh, moth called a cecropia moth, which is absolutely a gorgeous, gorgeous insect. Um, big uh, red spots on the on the wings with kind of a cream and tan color in there. Big, uh, it's a moth, so it has fuzzy antenna. Um, moths and butterflies, of course, are very similar. Um, moths, when they're resting their wings, their wings will be open. Butterflies, when they're resting their wings, their wings will be closed and they will be uh, kind of upright. Uh, that's one of the differences. Um, moths tend to fold their wings in where the uh, uh, butterflies tend to fold them upward when, they're, uh, when they have them closed. And uh, moths tend to feed at night, so they tend to be more nocturnal. Butterflies are uh, gonna be more active during the daytime. Butterflies have a very uh, thin antenna, maybe with a little club or something at the end. And uh, moths tend to have a more um, fuzzy, if you will, antenna. Moths tend to have a little thicker uh, body or abdomen than uh, butterflies, which tend to have a more slender abdomen. So if you're wondering what the difference between butterflies and moths, that's, uh, those are the, the, that's kind of the short answer. So a stilby. Uh, people don't commonly think of hostas as a pollinator friendly plant, but they are the, butterf or the uh, bumblebees absolutely love hosta flowers, as do uh, some of the hummingbirds. Um, some hostas don't really have beautiful flowers. Some of them I just reach in there and cut the flower stalk off. They, uh, they're, they're not pretty, they don't last real long. Some of them are gorgeous. This is guacamole hosta. It has a beautiful white, uh, slightly fragrant flower to it. The hummingbirds love it, the uh, bumblebees love it. Um, so I really like that. Stained glass is another good one. Uh, cathedral windows, um, some of them are purple, some are white, but they really, some of them have really beautiful flowers. So. Um, hostas obviously are great for shade and easy to grow. Moving right along here, this is a uh, Veronica called Red Fox. Um, it's not red, it's pink, but it's called Red Fox. So um, the uh, flowers have a really interesting kind of slightly bushy at the bottom, narrow uh, towards the tip. So it has a kind of a, looks a bit like a fox's tail, which I suppose is probably where the name comes from. But uh, beautiful pink flowers, uh, a favorite of both uh, butterflies and um, butterflies, moths, and uh, honeybees and bumblebees. This particular Veronica is going to get about 24 inches tall. Um, we have some shorter ones that spread right along the ground or are, are a little bit shorter, uh, some that get a little taller. Most of them are purpley blue. This one is more of a uh, pink color. Um, 
showed you a couple of shade plants. This is actually a, uh, a shade to part sun native uh, sedum. We don't normally think of sedum as being native in Illinois. We don't have too many succulent plants that are native in Illinois, um, but we do have a few. Uh, but this is a wonderful little uh, sedum called sedum ternatum, or uh, what's called wild stone crop. Um, it has a white flower. It's an early bloomer. Um, so it's a favorite of early pollinating, uh, of the pollinating species because it blooms early in the season. So it's all done blooming for the season. This was its flower here, which is actually, this is just pulling right off. So that was a nice white flower. Um, the, the bees love it. Um, they're all over it in the springtime. It's a ground cover. Um, you can plant it in rocky, dry areas. You can use it uh, underneath other larger shrubs and perennial species as a ground cover. Um, it, like I said, it, generally we think of sedum as a sunny plant, but this is actually a shade-loving uh, native sedum. Uh, I planted some of this, uh, or I, actually I didn't, but I designed it in um, to a native landscape that I was working on with an Eagle Scout. Uh, the Eagle Scout did the, uh, did the install um, over at the uh, historic uh, Gray Willows Farm, and um, beautiful rock ledges that had been installed uh, you know probably 80 years ago and the Eagle Scout cleaned that whole area up and we put all native species in there and in between the rocks and the steps along some of the cracks and crevices we uh, put in the wild stone crop and that was just last year and it has done exceptionally well already so really a neat plant. Another plant that we don't all often think of as a native here is uh, this right here, which is actually our native petunia. This is called wild petunia or uh, Ruellia. Um, small kind of ground covery or low mounding plant. Um, this will get a little more aggressive. It does reseed itself, but beautiful purple flowers on it. They're just starting to come into bloom. I just grabbed one of the plants that had a flower on it, but they're just starting to bloom right now. So that's wild petunia, um, 12 to 18 inches tall, uh, 18 maybe 24 inches wide like I said kind of spreading or mounding in habit gonna grab a few plants here that are gonna be we can kind of use these all sort of in the same grouping um, in terms of these are all later blooming um, later blooming native plants that uh, are just wonderful for any landscape. This is one of my favorite plants. This is called compass plant. Um, it is a member of the Silphium family and uh, uh, or Silphium genus I should more specifically say. So uh, Silphium includes um, the uh, prairie dock and the cup plant. I got a cup plant, we'll talk about that, uh, as well as rosin weed. But uh, compass plant has this really cool, um, you know, kind of deeply lobed or uh, whatever leaf. So really cool. It's got a very fuzzy, um, almost a uh, rough, coarse textured uh, leaf. But the reason it's called compass plant is that you will find this plant, especially once it gets itself established in your yard or in a prairie, and the leaves will always point north-south. So they orient themselves north and south. Um, I believe the reason for that is that it uh, provides for shade for the plant. So it allows it to cool itself. If you have a big broad leaf like this and that leaf faces the south, it's going to get beat on by that hot afternoon sun. And so it's going to need a lot more moisture to keep itself cool. So when that leaf turns itself or orients itself north-south, at the heat of the day, the sun is only catching a tiny little bit of the leaf and is not uh, shining on the broad section of the leaf and thereby cooling itself. So compass plant, the explorers used to use that to orient themselves. Um, so kind of a cool one. Big yellow sunflower-like flowers late in the season. Very tall plant. Give this one some room. It will get around seven feet tall. So that's a, that's a really large one. In that same family is cup plant. Another one of my favorites, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, that um, in order for survival, we all need food, shelter, and water. 
this plant can provide uh, both food and water, probably shelter too for some insects, but uh, it's a very large plant. It's called cup plant. It also has big, beautiful yellow sunflower-like flowers late in the season. But the reason that they call it cup plant is that the way that the leaf, um, the way that the leaf attaches itself to the flower stem, there's, there's almost a little vase right down at the bottom of the leaf. So the leaf looks like this. It's actually connected to the stem like that, and it forms a little cup or vase down at the bottom. So when it rains, water will collect right down there uh, in the cup. So uh, you will find uh, birds and insects and all sorts of stuff drinking the water right out of that little cup. Um, so I have this at home, and especially like at this time of year, um, rather than put out a dish of water, um, I mean, like I said, mentioned before, I do have a water feature um, that I have installed, but uh, a lot of times I will just take my hose and I will go out there and just spray, spray this plant down uh, just real quickly. The water will run right down the leaf and will collect right inside that little cup and then the birds and the insects will uh, drink out of there. These stems will develop, I mean, they're already very dense. This, it has kind of a squarish stem. It will get very dense and sturdy, um, so it can support the weight of that water, but it can also support the weight of songbirds and things like that. They'll perch on there, so it provides some shelter um, because it's so tall, they can get, the birds can get away from uh, animals that feed along the ground and things like that. Um, so food, water, and shelter all in one plant, so that's kind of cool. Um, this is a uh, Eupatorium or uh, pieweed. This is called Purple Joe pieweed. Um, this is an absolute butterfly magnet. It blooms late in the year, uh, August-ish, uh, September-ish. Um, another member of the same family is called uh, Bonset. Um, that's also a good one. It looks very similar. It's more of a uh, pale white. This is more of a purplish red uh, flower, quite tall. This is going to get upwards of four feet tall. Um, it likes the full sun. Um, it, could, it could even get even taller. The purple joe pieweed could get up to like six feet high. Um, uh, Bonset can take a little more shade. Purple joe pieweed would like more sun. Um, so that's a really cool one. This plant right here is just what we call a false sunflower. So it's Heliopsis. Uh, um, so it's false sunflower. As the name suggests, it looks just like a sunflower. So it has these large yellow, um, not a great photo there, large yellow flowers, uh, mid to late summertime, um, really a favorite of both songbirds and butterflies. Very tall, um, four plus feet. This is a, uh, a goldenrod uh, called stiff goldenrod. Um, very tall plant. Uh, this is a very late blooming plant, so September-ish time frame, uh, maybe late August and then all of September. Very large yellow flowers, kind of flat top, so not like you'd normally think of goldenrod being sort of a long stringy flower. This is gonna be more of a round flower that sits up top of the plant. It is a very tall, very sturdy plant, as the name suggests. Um, but this is, like I said, an absolute monarch magnet. The monarchs love these. It's a great source of nectar for them before they start heading south for the winter. Um, so it's a really great plant. It will reseed itself. Um, so it's really easy to find, though, because it has a pretty unique leaf, this big, long leaf here. So. If you find it, you can dig it up, you can get rid of it. It does not spread via rhizomes, which are those underground roots that grow. So if you see this popping up in an area where you don't want it, you can dig it up and give it to a friend uh, or plant it in some other part of the yard or just discard it. Um, but I believe that the, uh, the fact that it recedes itself um, shouldn't deter you from adding this wonderful plant to your landscape. I also brought a sweet uh, black-eyed Susan here which is, uh, many of you are familiar with it. This is our native one. We have uh, all sorts of different black-eyed Susans. There's um, a whole bunch of different varieties. Some stay really short, some are taller, um, but they all have the traditional dark center with the yellow petals all around it. 
Um, this is probably one of the absolute uh, easiest to grow perennials. Um, it's a staple in our prairies here in, in uh, northern Illinois uh, and a very prolific bloomer too, so it kind of makes it fun. This is um, called gray-headed coneflower or retibita. Um, it's just getting ready to bloom. So it's a later summer bloomer, um, probably another week or maybe now probably more like two weeks before it starts blooming. Uh, and then it'll bloom very heavily for month, month and a half. Uh, taller plant, three to four feet high. Uh, gray-headed coneflower uh, sort of looks like a cross between a coneflower and a black-eyed Susan. It is actually neither of those things, but they call it gray-headed coneflower. So kind of a grayish brown center with yellow petals that hang downward. Um, cool, kind of, you know, slightly ferny looking foliage, um, which is really nice. You know, a lot of our native plants um, have a more slender leaf and uh, slender leafed plants tend to be much more water efficient than large leafed plants. So our large leaf plants like the compass plant and prairie dock and things like that, like I mentioned, they've developed the ability to, to orient themselves so that they can shade themselves during the day. Um, but a lot of our native plants like the butterfly weed and things like that, they all have very slender, slender leaves. Um, the pale coneflower that we looked at earlier, <coughs> excuse me. That slender leaf uses up a lot less water or moisture than big leafed plants do. And so that's why they've been able to develop themselves as drought tolerant here in the, in the prairies. Um, also, they, uh, most of these plants have a very, very deep root system, uh, sometimes going down as far as 10 feet. Uh, so some of these root systems are absolutely incredible. They will go down 10 feet. So at home, I have a little area that I call my micro prairie. Uh, it's it's an uh, all native plant material that I've put in this area. And the lawn is it kind of it's bordered by lawn all the way around it. It's probably uh, 25, 30 feet long by 12 to 15 feet wide, sort of a peanut-shaped bed. And uh, it was, the bed was already there when I moved in, but I cleaned it all out. It has a brick edging around it, which I've left. And the prairie is on the inside, and the lawn is on the outside. And the lawn is all turning brown all the way around it because I could care less about my grass. It is turning brown because we are in a drought. My little micro prairie is blooming and green and beautiful, and I don't do a thing to it other than look for invasive species uh, like dandelions and uh, thistles and whatnot, and uh, just try to get rid of those when I see them periodically. That's it. It does not need water. It is established. Even in just a few years, it has developed itself very, very well. So um, our native plants are very well suited to uh, our hot, dry summers. We get just a couple more in here. This is uh, a coreopsis called sand coreopsis or uh, coreopsis lancelata. So again, it has that narrow leaf, um, which is kind of cool. Big bright yellow flowers. It blooms like crazy. I have this at home. It's in full bloom right now, or it has been at least for uh, two weeks now. Um, very large plant, about 36 plus inches tall. Uh, very bushy. Tons of flower stems and a very prolific bloomer. Uh, this would prefer it on the dry side as well, which is great. Uh, as the name suggests, sand coreopsis. It is native to our you know, sandier hills and, and some of those types of areas, which we actually do have around here. So that's sand coreopsis. This one, um, it's, a, it's a tall plant. Uh, this is our native um, beard tongue. It's called fox glove beard tongue or penstemon. It has these beautiful white flowers. It's a favorite of the bumblebees. Um, I have this at home, and a lot of times you only just see the bumblebees' butt sticking out the back because they're all the way inside there. They love it. Um, it's a tall plant. It'll get about 36 to maybe 40 inches tall. It's been blooming for about four-ish weeks right now. Um, average soils to moist-ish soils, so um, not crazy dry, but you do see it all over the prairies, even in very dry, so it is drought tolerant, um, but it does prefer a little more moisture than some of our others. Um, but that's foxglove beard tongue.
The uh, native meadow anemone is just finishing its bloom time. It's been uh, beautiful white flowers that started blooming in uh, mid-May. It is uh, now uh, mid-June and they're just finishing their bloom time. Um, really a pretty plant. It can take part sun to f kind of full sun, but it does really well because it comes up early in the season before the sun is too intense. It does its thing and then it gets shaded out by other plants in the, in the prairie. So. Uh, if you don't have the shade of other plants, then you could keep it in a part sun, part shade situation, and it does really well. I have some at home underneath a, a 30 year old crab apple. Um, the crab apple has a higher canopy, so some light gets through it, but not a lot, and it's done very well for me right there. I brought, uh, uh, this is aromatic aster, uh, a native here. We have many uh, native asters, New England aster, sky blue aster, smooth aster, big leafed aster, a whole bunch of others, uh, wooded aster, uh, white wood aster. But this, I just brought this one over, aromatic aster. All of the asters are great for uh, butterflies in particular. Uh, beautiful, this one has a purple flower, some of them are white. Um, asters are uh, a very late blooming uh, plant, so again, when you're trying to stage out your garden, you're gonna wanna have some things that bloom early, some things that bloom in the middle of the summer, which there are plenty of, and some things that bloom later in the season, like the aster. Uh, and this one right here, which is called Obedient Plant. Um, Obedient Plant has these beautiful, bright, pinky purple flowers. It will develop a flower stalk that comes up and it'll have these spiky flowers at the top. They are uh, very intensely colored. It's a really, um, there's not a lot that colors that color um, in the prairie here, nor are there a lot of plants that um, bloom with that color at that time of year. So it's really a neat one bright purpley pink uh, or more pinky purple I guess um, so that's a really nice one obedient plant uh, it does very well in the native or in the home landscape as well most of these plants that I've brought up are great for just an average landscape situation they do not need to be in a prairie or anything like that um, they can go in your landscape beds they can go just about anywhere um, they'll do really well I don't think any of the ones that I brought up here are uh, no none of these are uh, real wild or mangy plants at all. I think I just have two others here for you and then we will uh, conclude today's talk. I did not bring up uh, any other annuals other than this one right here. Whoops, looks like we broke a flower stalk. This is um, an annual, um, this is a verbena called Verbena bonariensis. Um, it is a, uh, a kind of a wild looking plant. It gets quite tall, about 36 inches tall, maybe even a little taller. It develops these uh, bright purple flowers at the top. It is just an absolute butterfly magnet. They absolutely love it. Um, the reason I brought it up here is I've been plant, or actually I planted this at home several years ago. It, um, it's in a pollinator garden that I created, not my native garden. It is not a native plant here. Um, but I have another pollinator garden that I've developed specifically for the pollinators. And I planted some Verbena bonariensis at the edge of the bed where it gets full hot sun. It is very dry and it reseeds itself every year. I've never had to replant it, so it's kind of fun. Um, it's easy to find if you want to pull it up if it's reseeding itself in an area where you don't want it. But um, it's kind of neat because it's an annual, but I just planted it that one time and it just keeps coming back every year. If you don't want it to come back, you can uh, cut off the flowers before they go to seed at the end of the year. So um, that's Verbena bonariensis. And uh, I brought up an earlier blooming plant here. This is already done blooming. In fact, uh, it, this is a woodland, this is a woodland phylox uh, called Blue Moon. Uh, so as the name suggests, it grows in part shade, woodland situation, maybe at the edge of some other trees, or if you have some older trees that have some light that shines through, you could use the blue woodland phlox. It has a, a bluish colored flower, um, but it, it's all done blooming for the year. We just cut off the dead flowers, and here we have a beautiful plant again. So it's very nice, um, you know, ready to be planted or sold, um, but it, it's an early, bloom, uh, early blooming plant. So again, a lot of these plants, when they're all done blooming, they don't have to be dead headed or trimmed back. But if you do want a little more neat appearance, you can go in there, you can take that whole plant with all the spent flowers and just trim it back. So we'll do the same thing with this uh, sand coreopsis that I mentioned before. 
when this is all done blooming, it'll bloom uh, for probably another month anyway, when it's all done blooming, if we're trying to sell the plant and keep it looking really nice, we'll take the whole thing just like this, no rhyme or reason, just trim it all back like that, just like you're putting your hair in a ponytail, cut it all off, and then just let it grow back. It takes a very short amount of time, and it'll just grow right back. So if you want to keep it neat and tidy, you can do that. Uh, that will also prevent uh, plants that tend to reseed themselves, that will prevent them from reseeding themselves uh, in, your, in your landscape, so you can do that. Uh, if you want a more neat and tidy appearance. Uh, otherwise, you just let it go, uh, as I do at home. And, um, you know, then, like I said, sometimes the birds will feed off of the seeds, other animals will feed off of the seeds, and you'll have uh, some forage for them later on in the season. And if you're lucky, some of them may reseed themselves and uh, provide uh, more plants uh, for you or for your friends or neighbors. So um, that was probably a lot like drinking water from a fire hose. Um, like I said, there's a million plants we could talk about. Probably could have just had five more carts up here and just spent the whole day talking about other species, um, but that would get uh, very boring for you, I'm quite sure. But I brought up a lot of plants. Um, certainly some of these you can find a good home for in your landscape. Um, as always, if you have any questions, come on in, ask us. We'll help you find the right plant for the right spot. That's what we do. Um, we're going to be posting some resources uh, on Facebook, but uh, again, if you're not already a member of our uh, VIG newsletter, just go right to our website, wascoNursery.com. I think you can scroll all the way to the bottom and uh, just says like sign up for our newsletter. It says I think there is a little VIG thing, but it just says sign up for our newsletter. Sign up, like I said, we'll send you a five dollar coupon, um, but we'd love to uh, send you some of these resources. Like I said, we are not going to. Uh, uh, flood your inbox with uh, with emails on a regular basis it's um, or on a daily basis or anything like that. Um, so do that. One last plug for our food truck festival tomorrow, Sunday, June 20th, uh, in our uh, West Lawn area. We will have uh, some great food trucks and fun. We'll take care of, there's going to be lots of tables and other stuff set up. You can also bring your own lawn chairs. You can bring a, a blanket and set up a picnic area, whatever you want to do. Uh, it's come and go as you please. There's no uh, no set agenda or anything like that. 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, Sunday is our first ever food truck festival, so we hope you'll join us for that. Thanks again for watching. As always, we're here seven days a week. If you have any questions, we're here to help. See you next time.